Welcome to Historically Haunted, a podcast that takes a look at a historical location that also has a haunted reputation. So come with me as together we enter the strange and creepy world of the unexplained and keep history fun along the way. everyone and welcome back to Historically Haunted. I am your host Ariel and today I will be covering the old Lincoln County Hospital found in Tennessee. Today's listener's suggestion episode was suggested by Cody. Cody also has had a paranormal experience inside this building and I will be sharing his story with all of you in today's episode. I also found some other really cool haunted locations in Tennessee that I will be talking about as well. Before I get started, I just wanted to say how happy I am to be back. If you are new to the show or you didn't see my announcements on social media, I took a few months off so that I could move across the country. I keep my private life pretty close to the vest because I just want to focus on the content that I create, but I have been getting many questions lately, so I thought I would just tell you all a brief summary of why I moved and how my trip went. The state I moved to is North Carolina, and I was living in a very small town located in Northern California. I had a hard time fitting into my small county that I grew up in, and while I did have some family and friends there, including my best friend Katie, who I miss so much, I never really felt welcome in the town that I grew up in as a whole. So I was living with my parents in California because, well, California is super expensive and roommates and me just never worked out. So I kept having to move in and out of my parents' house and wasting money when people, you know, would bail mid-lease and I would be stuck with an increase into my monthly rent. So I finally got fed up with it when I turned 26 and I decided to just live with my parents and save up. When I started my podcast in the summer of 2019, I had all these great ideas for places that I wanted to travel to so that I could expand my show and turn it into more of a vlog series on YouTube. And right when I was about to put those plans in motion in early 2020, the pandemic hit and we all know what happened. My plans along with everyone else's in the world had to be put on hold. Two years later and my parents decided to move to North Carolina to retire and I decided to go with them because why not? The location is much better for me to travel all over the East Coast and start doing my vlogging series the proper way and I can finally visit some historically haunted spots and report back to you guys about what my experience was like while I was there. My parents sold their house and we packed up the moving truck and officially pulled out of the driveway on May 7th. This was supposed to be an eight day trip so I sold my car with the plan that their SUV SUV was for the cats and one person to drive and they would follow in the moving truck and my dad was going to be driving the moving truck and we were going to switch off who was driving what vehicle as needed. The first day went smoothly but the next day it all went wrong. Looking back it's kind of funny but when it was happening it was awful. We stopped at our next hotel on the list of hotels across the country and when we got there we got hit with the worst stomach flu I have had in years. My parents never get sick and this was the sickest that we had all been uh, since forever. To top it off we were in a horrible dive of a hotel it was smelly and the floor of the bathroom was like warped and the shower was yellow it was really gross and it was just horrible it was supposed to be just a quick one night stay but we ended up staying there a whole three nights because we were so sick we couldn't leave after we were at least okay to leave the hotel we all were still so sick and my dad couldn't drive the moving truck um, due to high winds because of how achy his body still was and my mom and I were also still super weak So we drove to the closest city, which was Salt Lake. We ordered a pod, unpacked the truck, and repacked the pod in the parking lot of the pod place. We did this in just under two hours. Because of the large crate that we were using for the cats, it was taking up the whole back seat. So my mom had to fly out to North Carolina to stay with her friends while my dad and I finished the drive in the SUV. When we got to North Carolina, it took us a while to find somewhere to live. So we had to stay in a hotel for a few weeks. Everything was in the pod, still at the pod facility so I was just living out of a backpack at that point and I didn't have any of my electronics with me but luckily we did find a place to live and um, we moved in here barely three weeks ago I think it's only two and a half weeks ago we had no furniture in the beginning um, so we were literally sitting on boxes for a few days we eventually did get like a couch and our beds and that kind of stuff so that's good and I was able to get my desk 
Um, I ordered my desk right away, but somehow it accidentally got shipped to my old address in California. So um, shout out to my friend Crystal for helping me get my desk back through FedEx sending it back. So I got my money back. So thank you so much, Crystal, for doing that for me. After that mess up, I was able to reorder a new desk from Amazon to make sure it came here and got here on time. And it did. So about three days ago, I was able to build this. I got a chair. I found all of my equipment in various boxes and I finally set up the podcasting setup. I still have a lot of things to figure out. I'm actively looking for work right now. So I did apply to a few places yesterday. So fingers crossed, I get at least a callback for one of those. And um, yeah, so that's basically my story of me moving to North Carolina and why I did. Um, I hope it wasn't too long for you guys. I tried to summarize it as quickly as possible. And oh, my cats, Thor and Loki did awesome, by the way, in case anyone was wondering. They were nervous and obviously a little scared and they were kind of confused as to what the heck was going on, but they were with us and they felt safe with us. So it wasn't that bad. And now they're settling in pretty well, especially since we got some furniture and I think, you know, the place smells like us again, because you know how cats are when things don't smell like them. They're not, they get all weird, but they're settling in nicely. So that's really good. Um, thank you to everyone who followed my journey on Instagram and Facebook, because like I said, plans changed and I got so sick. I didn't vlog the trip like I was planning to, but I did post some photos of the trip. If you would like to see those photos, they are on my Instagram page. I have a link down below for the Instagram page if you'd like to go check that out. And uh, thank you all so much for the kind words of encouragement throughout this whole process. I am so glad to be back with all of you. I missed you guys so much and I am so excited for this new year of the podcast journey that I'm on. If you didn't skip ahead through all of this, thank you so much for listening to my moving story. Now that I've got that out of the way, it's back to business as usual. So I wanted to start off with thanking my amazing Patreons. You guys help make this show possible so that I can afford the monthly host fees as well as helping me upgrade to new equipment and pay for the rights for the music and sound effects that you hear on the show. I did not charge my Patreons during the move because I thought it was not fair to take money when I was not working on the show and I could not actively post bonus episodes. So May, June, and July are free to my Patreons. The monthly payments will go back into effect though on August 1st. Just a heads up, just in case you need to cancel. I know that money is super tight right now, so no hard feelings if anyone has to leave. I completely understand. So speaking of Patreons, I have some new members to thank and I don't have their list right now. I lost my Patreon list somewhere in the mess of boxes, but I'm going to find it by the next episode, I promise, and uh, I will announce who my newest Patreon members are as soon as I figure out who I've already said and that kind of thing. But uh, sorry, I'm still a little scatterbrained. Oh, and I hope also hope that this recording is not uh, very echoey. I don't have any artwork on the walls in my room right now, so I hung up a bunch of fabric to try to keep the echo effect down. So I hope it's not too bad. I've also been playing with the microphone. So if it's really bad, I do apologize. Hopefully the next episode will be about more back to normal because I am going to buy some artwork to put up to help with the echo effect. So anyway, like I was saying, if you recently signed up for my Patreon, thank you so much. I will be sure to name drop you in the next episode once I find all of my paperwork and get everything back to normal. Um, if you are interested in becoming a Patreon, you should check out the link in my show notes down below. Uh, for just a dollar a month, you too can get access to bonus episodes that I make when I have extra time, photos of historical places that I talk about in my episodes, and you will get a thank you card with a logo sticker in the mail after your first payment goes through. Also, leaving a written review on iTunes is a quick and free way to help support the show. The more reviews I receive, it will help the show pop up when people are searching for a new paranormal podcast to try. Also, leaving a starred review on Spotify is another quick and free way to help support the show. All right. All right, that's all for the housekeeping for today. Thank you all so much for listening to my moving story. And now let's get this episode started. Hospitals are weird places. They are a place where new life starts. People come in hopes of healing, and sadly, it can be a place where many take their last breath. Working hospitals can be full of strange emotion. In one room, there can be joy, and in the next, sorrow. It's no wonder why many people don't like hospitals, not just because of the weird smells and sterile walls, but the intense mix of emotions in one building can become overwhelming and sometimes draining. It is easy to see how all of that emotional energy could get trapped in the walls over the years of the hospital being in use. But what happens when the facility closes up? 
and the hallways and rooms remain empty. Paint chipping, wallpaper peeling, water dripping, and medical equipment and files left scattered around as if it was just in use last week. Many paranormal investigators believe that hospitals can be a hotbed for paranormal activity. They are also a good place for local teens to create some urban legends. Old Lincoln County Hospital is located in Fayetteville, Tennessee. Fayetteville is the largest city in Lincoln County, but it has a small town feel. Lincoln County is on the land that used to be part of the Cherokee and Chickasaw territory before the tribes were forced out by European settlers in the late 17 and early 1800s. Fayetteville was established in 1809, and the town was named after Fayetteville, North Carolina. Some of the town's earliest residents actually lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina, before moving to the area in Tennessee, so this inspired the name. Before deciding on Fayetteville for the town's name, the town was named after Lafayette, the famous French general who helped the U.S. during the Revolutionary War. Lincoln County was named after Major General Benjamin Lincoln. He was the second in command to the U.S. Army during the end of the American Revolutionary War. The city was created after one of the earliest white settlers named Ezekiel Norris donated 100 acres of his own land so a town could be constructed. Over time, it evolved into a small bustling city full of cute shops and historic buildings. In 1952, a devastating F4 tornado did major damage to businesses, homes, and other buildings. 150 people were injured and sadly, two people lost their lives during this violent storm. Today, the city's focus is on tourism with cute boutiques, restaurants, and specialty shops. The town's storefronts make you feel as if you've gone back in time and they also have two distilleries as part of the Tennessee Whiskey Trail. Lincoln County Hospital was built in 1935. Over the years, it expanded to make room for more patients until it became what it is today, a large three-story brick building with wings that were added over the years. The hospital closed on September 10, 2001, after a new facility was built in a new location. After its closure, the building fell into disrepair. The building has slowly been falling apart over the years, but the ghostly activity did not start once the hospital was empty. According to former hospital staff members, the building has always been a hot spot for paranormal activity. After the building was left empty, it did not take long for local residents to start to notice some strange things that were happening inside, especially at night. One of the main claims about the building is the report of lights being on on the third floor. People who live nearby often call 911 to report lights being on and officers have to search the building after each call. The description of these lights is not described as soft light from a lantern or a flashlight or someone's cell phone. They actually describe it as if someone had turned on the light switch in the room and the whole window is illuminated. The only problem with this claim is that there is no electricity to the building. While doing my research, I had a harder time finding some of the information online, but when I did Google this location, of course, there was a Ghost Adventures episode about this location. So I watched it, and you guys know how I feel about Ghost Adventures. I enjoy watching ghost hunting shows, but I have a hard time watching them for some reason. It's hard for me to believe them when they're so overly dramatic, and if you do like them, that's totally fine. That's just my opinion. I just can't get into the way that they do their ghost hunting as easily as I can other shows. However, However, this episode did help me out quite a bit because I did have a hard time finding information online. So this is season 14, episode four. And while Zach and his team were outside of the building filming, a police car pulled up. Zach went over to the officers to inform them that they indeed had permission from the owner to be on the property. The officers told them that a local had called the station asking why a film crew was hanging around the building. After confirming that the crew had permission from the owner to be there, 
Commander of the Fayetteville Police Department, Jesse Cassius II, agreed to have Zach ask him a few questions about the vandalism that has sadly happened to the building. But Jesse actually told Zach about a paranormal experience that he had once while searching the building. He also knew other officers who have pulled up to the building at night to see lights on on the third floor, but when they entered the building to go check, there were no lights on inside at all. Again, there is no electricity to this building, so that should not even be possible. One night, Jesse entered the building after getting a call about lights being on on the third floor. He entered and searched the whole building, and while he was in there, he claims that he felt something cold brush against his hand and lower arm. This freaked him out quite a bit, and he left immediately. The feeling of something touching people's arm and hand is a normal occurrence. Many people believe this is the spirit of a little girl who died on the second floor. Mark Kelso worked at the hospital as a respiratory specialist for 15 years. He was in his first year on the job when a nine-year-old girl passed away only hours after he had worked on her. She liked to see Mark when he came into her room on his rounds. After she passed away, Mark was heavily affected because it was the first patient he had lost and she was so young when she passed away. After her death, nurses and other staff members started to see the ghost of a little girl playing in the hallways at night only to disappear. After the building closed, Mark felt a draw back to the building and he decided to go with a paranormal group who did not know his personal story about this little girl. As the group were walking the halls, a medium who was with them started to describe a little girl who was following them. The description was spot on to the little girl that Mark had treated over 15 years ago and it chilled him to the bone. Mark said that he felt like the little girl was still looking for him even though the building was shut down. The ghost of this little girl has been seen, heard, and felt by many paranormal investigators. She enjoys playing with the toys that paranormal teams bring with them, and she is also extremely vocal, both in EVPs and she has been heard in real time. People have heard her singing, laughing, and talking. She also likes to run through the halls, especially on the second floor, and she likes to hold people's hands. When she holds people's hands, it's described as a cold feeling as if something brushes down your arm and into your hand. The building has other spirits wandering around as well. Nurses and doctors have been seen walking around the halls along with apparitions in hospital gowns. The sound of footsteps, slamming of doors, and EVPs have all been caught on digital recorders as well as heard with the naked ear. Disembodied voices, moans, and even screams have been heard. During the Ghost Adventures episode, the team was walking through the building with the owner, and they were heading to the third floor when they heard a disembodied voice of what sounded like a little girl. The group all stopped to listen, and they heard the slamming of doors and the sound of loud footsteps walking on the floor above them. Inside the old crematorium building, a paranormal group called the Bama Boys caught a strange EVP encounter. During the EVP session, they caught the voice of an angry man yelling, leave! And right after, a voice of a little girl saying, you're mean! After they played back the recording and heard these voices, they claimed that the energy in the room shifted and the ceiling tiles began to pop and fall on them, making them run out of the room. Now, the building is falling down anyways, so I don't know if that was just a coincidence or if it was truly caused by the angry man ghost. But that is a very interesting experience to have nonetheless. There is an entity that has been in this building ever since the hospital first opened, and they call it the Angel of Death. Nurses claim to have seen this figure illuminated in a bright white light hovering over patients that were about to take their last breath. One group of nurses claim to have seen this figure hovering over a man on life support, and when the patient flatlined, the figure vanished. No one knows who or what this entity is, but some believe it acts as a type of grim reaper, taking their soul to the afterlife, while some think that this entity steals people's souls right as they pass away. Our listener who suggested this location had a paranormal experience inside the building and Cody was kind enough to share it with me so that I could share it with all of you. My story starts off as just a normal experience. My cousin is a paranormal investigator and I would periodically join him with some of the investigations when my schedule would allow me to join. While sadly the old hospital is in great and a sad state of decay, now due to those issues, 
one of the only safe times you can go in and do these investigations is in the winter due to the mold issue. Also, because of vandalism problems, it is required to have someone who knows the owner and is authorized to enter. Due to these issues, we would also lock ourselves in for the night and were there until morning doing tours and conducting our investigations. We typically started off with a general tour of all three floors and along the way we would tell the group of the local legends and lore surrounding the hospital. While we were doing this, one night on the second floor I was standing near the back of the group and in the corner of my eye I caught a glimpse of a doctor standing next to me, which is interesting and unique in itself. While leading a group downstairs, we caught an EVP of a voice mentioning three distinct things. Pluto could have been the planet, but we don't know if it was referring to the Mickey Mouse dog. Also, the voice mentioned trucks and army men. We do know for a fact that some children did die while this hospital was in operation, so it might have been the voice of a child ghost. We also witnessed many glowing orbs when I spoke to the ghost in the downstairs morgue area. We also communicated with the ghost of a young girl who was there at some time and would take cystic fibrosis treatments, but she sadly did not live and we had some luck communicating with her using one of the old respiratory therapists she loved named Mark. This was a unique experience and the group was great and the old Lincoln County Hospital ghosts were very communicative. The only negative experience we had is one night someone decided that they were going to take a pair of skates made for an amputee child. A ghost, we're not sure who, it never identified himself or herself, but we clearly got a recording of it calling the lady who was planning on taking the skates a B word and this was repeatedly said. She decided to leave the skates, probably a great decision on her part. In the end, this was a great experience. Sadly, I have not gotten to do many adventures now with two little ones, but I really enjoy hearing your podcasts and your adventures. Hopefully, I can go do more investigations later in life. Thank you so much, Cody, for suggesting this location. I hope I did it justice. I packed in as much information as I could find. I know it was a little shorter than usual, but I really hope that you guys enjoyed the Lincoln County Hospital. And again, thank you so much, Cody, for suggesting this and sending me your personal paranormal experience. I found it really cool that you actually got to work with Mark. Um, That's really awesome that he's still doing ghost hunting. And that actually backs up many of the claims that he said on the ghost adventure show. And I think that's really cool. So So thanks again, Cody, for sending that in. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, I have two more locations to add to this episode. And first up is going to be the Lotes House. And for this story, we have to go back in time to the mid-1800s. house is located in the downtown historic district in Franklin, Tennessee. The white two-story house was built by Jonathan Albert Lotz. Lotz was born in Germany in 1820. He was a skilled woodworker, eventually becoming a master craftsman. He moved to the United States to join other family members who had also moved to the U.S. He arrived in New Orleans Square in 1846 and later met his future wife, Margreta. The couple later moved to Franklin, Tennessee and purchased five acres of land. Lotz built his home in the Greek Revival style. The front of the house has a widow's walk with four large columns. Lotz constructed the furniture and cabinetry for the home, and he also made a piano for his wife. Mr. Lotz built the house himself without the use of slave labor. This was seen very odd by his neighbors, and this would later be used against him. Mr. Lotz's family used the house as a showroom for clients to come and pick out what they wanted Jonathan to make for them. Jonathan and Margreta had six children, Paul, Amelia, Augustus, Matilda, and twins, Julius and Julia. Paul and Amelia were from Margareta's previous marriage. The family lived in the home peacefully for several years until one morning when the family woke up to a battalion of Union troops passing just outside their doorstep. The Battle of Franklin, one of the most bloody the bloodiest battles of the Civil War was about to begin. During the 
the summer of 1864, the United States was entering its final year of the Civil War. On September 1st, the city of Atlanta, one of the key railroad supply depots for the Confederacy, fell to the Union forces after a grueling four-month-long siege. General William T. Sherman led Union troops to defeat Lieutenant General John B. Hood at the Battle of Atlanta. After Union troops took control of the city, Hood's army retreated and began attacking the now Union supply line. Hood's intent was to cause enough damage that Sherman would have to go after him. In doing this, Sherman's army would be drawn out of the city and away from his own supply line. At first, Sherman did go after Hood, but it didn't take long for him to realize what Hood was doing. Sherman quickly became sick of chasing Hood around, so Sherman sent Major General John Schofield's army with his 30,000 troops to defend Nashville, while Sherman turned towards Savannah and began his famous march to the sea. While Sherman's troops began their march, Schofield's army headed for Nashville. Along the way, Schofield's men followed the Tennessee and Duck Rivers. Hood's men attacked Schofield's army as they moved toward the city. For a month, they would engage in small skirmishes along the riverbanks until the Battle of Spring Hill. On November 28th, the Union Army engaged in a larger scale attack by Confederate troops, but this time Hood was able to encircle part of Schofield's troops. This move split Schofield's army, leaving a large number of men trapped in Columbia, Tennessee. However, due to major miscommunication and confusion among the Confederate troops, Schofield's men were able to escape and regroup nearby Franklin. This blunder enraged General Hood, who ordered his men to immediately pursue Schofield's army. On November 28th, Union troops regrouped in Franklin, Tennessee. Schofield knew a counterattack was coming, and rather than continue his march to Nashville, he decided that he would have his army prepare for an attack. The Union army quickly created three lines of defense to delay the movements of the Confederate troops. They created an abatis line made from tangled and sharpened tree branches. They also created multiple breastworks, which are made by piling any material they could find, such as fences, logs, and rocks. They worked all night to prepare, and meanwhile, exhausted Confederate troops were camped a few miles outside of Franklin. While they were all sleeping, more Union forces were able to slip by unseen to join Schofield's army, leaving the Confederate troops to awaken to an even larger Union army. Meanwhile, at the Lotz house, the Lotz family woke up on November 30th to a sea of Union troops and supply wagons passing by their home. Mr. Lotz and his neighbor, Fountain Branch Carter, quickly realized the danger their families were in. Lotz knew his family would never survive inside their wooden house. Luckily, Mr. Carter offered for his family to hide in their brick home that also had a basement. Lotz grabbed as many of his wood working tools as he could, and he and his family ran to the Carter's basement. The Battle of Franklin began around 4 o'clock p.m. and lasted five hours. 33,000 Confederate troops went up against 30,000 Union troops. The Confederate Army approached in a two-mile-long line across an open field where Union cannon fire rained down upon them. Then the Confederates had to fight their way through the breastworks and then the abatis, and finally engaged in brutal hand-to-hand combat combat in the Carter's garden. It was the most bloody hand-to-hand combat of the war. The sound of battle must have been deafening. But those sounds of cannon fire and muskets and hand-to-hand combat slowly turned into screams of the mortally wounded and dying. The battle raged on until it was too dark to continue. Many soldiers died of friendly fire. By daybreak, the Lotz and the Carters emerged from their hiding place to find bodies stacked six men deep, scattered all over their properties. By morning, six Confederate generals were dead, and a total of 1,750 Confederate soldiers were killed, and 3,800 were wounded. On the Union side, 189 were killed, and just over 1,000 were wounded. Hood retreated during the night and Schofield gathered his remaining army and continued to Nashville. After the battle, Lotz and the Carters were left with a huge mess. Not only were there rotting corpses, including 17 dead horses in their front yard, 
but the Lotz family home was severely damaged. Though it was still standing, it was riddled with bullet holes. Cannon fire holes and burns could be seen throughout the home. Many remain today. The south wall was completely blown away and there are singe marks left on the wood floors. The house quickly became a field hospital to attend to the many wounded. The bodies of Confederate soldiers were quickly buried in shallow graves with nothing more than a wooden marker. Later on, the bodies were exhumed and reburied in McGavick's Confederate Cemetery, not too far from the Lotz family house. Mr. Lotz quickly repaired his house but was upset with the rush job he did. However, he and his family would have to leave their home not soon after the war. Mr. Lotz created a new piano and he decided to carve the symbol of the bald eagle holding the American flag upward in one talon and the Confederate flag upside down in the other. When word spread of his new art piece, it outraged Confederate sympathizers. They threatened Mr. Lotz and his family, so they quickly had to sell their house and move out west to San Jose, California. His daughter Matilda, who was only six during the battle, became a famous painter and attended the San Francisco School of Design. However, the battle had a deep impact on her and she would struggle with PTSD the rest of her life. Matilda painted a portrait of then California Governor Leland Stanford and it now hangs in Stanford University. The Lotz family and the property surrounding it went through a lot of tragedy. Today, the house is a museum and a historic site. They also give out ghost tours because it wouldn't surprise anyone to hear that this whole area is extremely haunted. The most famous ghosts inside the Lotz family home is the children. Like I mentioned in the beginning, Jonathan and Margreta had twins, Julius and Julia. Sadly, both passed away at a young age. It was hard to me to find the truth behind their deaths and when exactly they died. I ran into many articles and videos that changed the story of how the children passed away. Some sources say that they died of an illness a few weeks before the battle. Another says that they died two days before the battle while playing in the creek on their property. Some articles say that they drowned while playing in the water, while some stories claim that the twins were poisoned due to the Union troops preparing for the battle to come. This version says that the Union troops poisoned the water supply upstream and it floated down to where the children were playing. When I went to the official Lotz House website, I could not find anything about the twins' deaths at all. And actually, as far as I could find, I didn't even see anything about the twins, period. So I don't know if this was just an urban legend or if this actually happened or if they did die but people came up with the poisoned water for dramatic effect after the fact. I have no idea. If anyone knows the truth behind the Lotz twins' deaths, please let me know in the comments on either my Instagram or Facebook group page. While this story changes, the ghost stories remain. Many visitors have claimed to see Julia looking out of a window that used to be the children's bedroom. Right when people get a good look at her, she vanishes. Both children have been seen playing on the staircase as well as peeking around corners at guests. Some have heard them laughing and playing in empty rooms. And the sound of small running footsteps have been heard upstairs when the rooms are empty. There is a story about a couple who had stayed the night in one of the rooms upstairs. In the middle of the night, they were both woken up to the sound of a snare drum playing in the distance. They went outside to see what was going on, but when they opened the door, the sound suddenly stopped and there was no one around. The ghost of a woman in a long white nightgown has been seen at the top of the staircase on multiple occasions. She is holding a candle in her hand and she calls out for a woman named Anne before she vanishes. Disembodied talking, singing, and even screams have been heard both inside and outside 
inside the home. Objects move around a lot, especially pipes and whiskey bottles that are on display for the museum. Workers have often opened the house in the morning to find these objects placed in random spots in rooms far from their original location. There is a lot of activity that happens at the Lotz family home. The spirits there seem to be extremely interactive and seem to enjoy the attention. Many paranormal groups have investigated the house with good results. They have experienced good flashlight sessions, K2 meters going off regularly, EVPs have been captured, and on the grounds, people speak of strange lights moving in the tree line. Shadow figures and full-bodied apparitions of soldiers on both sides have been seen. For our last location located in Tennessee, you're going to need a virtual ticket because we are going to check out the Orpheum Theater. Orpheum Theater is located in Memphis, Tennessee. Before becoming the Orpheum Theater, it was known as the Grand Opera House. The Grand Opera House opened in 1890 and was called the most classy theater outside of New York City. It was best known for its many vaudeville performances. In 1907, the theater joined the Orpheum Circuit and the name was changed to the Orpheum Theater. The theater was successful for almost 20 years until a fire broke out in 1923 and burned it to the ground. Quickly after the fire, the theater was rebuilt and on November 19, 1928, it reopened. The theater could seat 2,300 people and it was twice as large as the original. The interior was decorated in the Art Deco style with glittering gold and silver leaf plush carpeting and crystal chandeliers, marble flooring, and they installed a Woolitzer organ. As vaudeville's popularity started to die out, many theaters began switching from live performances to movie houses. In 1940, a movie theater chain named Lightman's purchased the theater, changed the theater's name to Malco, and it began showing only movies. By the 1970s, Megaplex theaters became more popular than single movie houses. So in 1976, Lightman's decided to sell the building. The Memphis Development Foundation bought the old theater in 1977. They brought back the Orpheum's name and brought Broadway plays and concerts to the theater. Over the years, it has had three major renovations, restoring it back to its former glory, as well as making modern improvements to the sound and special effects. The theater has hosted Broadway productions such as Disney's Lion King, Wicked, and Les Miserables. Many famous entertainers have performed here, like Sarah McLean, Tony Bennett, Mary J. Blige, Bob Dylan, Jerry Seinfeld, and Tyler Perry. Today, the Orpheum Theater is on the National Registry of Historic Places. And if you've listened to my theater episode, then you know that all theaters come with a ghost story or two. The Orpheum Theater actually has seven ghosts that love to haunt the area. The most famous ghost is a little girl named Mary. She is described as a young girl in a 1920s style white dress with dark hair that are in braids. According to urban legend, Mary was crossing the street with her family on the way to enter the theater when she was sadly struck and killed by a streetcar. Ever since then, her ghost has been seen and heard inside the theater. Now, I say urban legend because there is no proof that this actually happened. However, some people are seeing the ghost of a little girl. So either the ghost just showed up one day and they made up the story to justify why she would be there, or the legend took off and created its own tulpa. Mary has a favorite seat that she likes to use during performances. 
It is up in the balcony and it is in box one, seat C5. Mary is a very active spirit. She likes to pull pranks on guests who enter the theater as well as theater crew. One time she took the housekeeper's tools and put them in the toilet. She also doesn't like people sitting in her seat. There is a story of a woman who attended a Jerry Seinfeld show and sat in box one, seat C5. During the show, she began to feel a tapping on her shoulder. Each time she felt this, she turned around to see no one behind her. The tapping persisted so much that it actually prevented her from enjoying the show. She believes that it was Mary unhappy that she was sitting in her seat. During the run of the stage production Annie, the stage crew had something unexplainable occur. One morning, they came in to prepare for a performance. As they went backstage, they realized that the dollhouse was missing. In the play Annie, there is a moment where Daddy Warbucks gives Annie a huge dollhouse as a Christmas present. It is so large that it takes several stagehands to move it on and off stage. After realizing it was missing, they began searching the theater for it. It came to a shock when they found it in box number one. Many believe that Mary wanted to play with this dollhouse and somehow managed to pick it up and bring it to her box. Many other people have seen Mary as well. One time a guest was entering the theater when she and her friends saw a small girl in 1920s style dress dancing to the pre-show music. As they watched, she faded away before their eyes. One time, several cast members of the show Fiddler on the Roof claimed to have seen Mary sitting on the balcony in her favorite seat, thoroughly enjoying the show before she vanished. Several people have said to also feel her presence. It's described as an icy cold spot with an eerie feeling. When the theater is empty, cleaning crews have reported a little girl laughing, singing, and even dancing on the stage. While Mary may be the most famous ghost, she is not the only one to haunt the theater. In fact, it's believed that there are a total of seven ghosts. In the upper balconies area, there is said to be a ghost named Eleanor. Eleanor is a sad ghost. When she is seen, most people report her crying before she vanishes. Other apparitions have been seen in the building, from a woman to a man in all period clothing. There is an interesting story about a repairman who was trying to fix the theater's organ. The task was taking much longer than he anticipated and it kept him late into the night. He became frustrated and he decided he needed to go for a break. So he locked up the building and left, got a cup of coffee, cleared his head and came back ready to work all night until he fixed it. When he walked into the organ room, he was stunned by what he saw. In the short time he had been gone, someone had fixed the organ. There has never been an explanation for this and it really freaked the guy out to this day. When the theater was declining in the 1970s, a homeless man snuck into the theater and was accidentally locked into the fifth floor gallery. The night watchman did not know he was there as he was going about his rounds late at night. The watchman suddenly heard a terrifying scream and the sound of someone running down five flights of stairs. The man then kicked open the locked gallery door, knocking it off his hinges as he proceeded to run while screaming through the lobby out into the entrance hall, out through the entrance doors, and down the street. No one knows why he did this or what he saw to make him that terrified. The night watchman was quite unnerved by this encounter, and he had an eerie feeling about the building ever since. The theater has a lot of paranormal activity, from objects moving to hearing voices in empty rooms, from the sound of even dancing on the stage when it's empty, and the sound of footsteps on and off the stage. Many apparitions have been seen, shadow figures have been seen, as well as the theater curtain moving on its own. It sounds like to me the Orpheum Theater is one haunted place. If you're ever lucky enough to go to this theater for a production, Keep an eye out to your seats right and left. That might not be a human sitting next to you. It could be a ghost. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode as we checked out the Lincoln County Hospital and some other haunted hotspots in Tennessee. 
Thank you so much, Cody, for allowing me to share your personal paranormal experience as well as suggesting this location. I had a lot of fun covering it, and I hope that you guys had fun listening to it. This particular episode took me a lot longer than I expected to get it on the air. Um, This was recorded over the course of several days. I got interrupted because I have some things to do. I mean, if anyone has moved to another state, you guys know the drill. It's so much. You have to get, you know, new insurance. You have to switch your license. You have to do every, all of these steps. So this week got really broken up with me having to do my adult duties. (laughs) Um, But I'm so glad that I finally got this episode out to you guys. During my recording of this, I also got interrupted because I had a job interview and then I had to prepare for that job interview. So a lot of things went up. Uh, happened last week, but I'm glad that I finally got this episode out. I hope I get this job. If I do, I'll be able to narrow down a better schedule on releasing new episodes and when I'm going to do research and recording. So everything's just a little chaotic in my life right now, but I am just happy to be back. This episode was hard to get out on the air, but now that I have this one out, I feel like I've got back into how to do this because I was a little bit nervous to be in front of the microphone again because it's been so many months. So um, yeah, anyway, thank you all so much for your patience. I am so happy that I'm back and I can't wait to bring you guys more content soon. The next episode is going to be a listener's episode. I have to go through email still. I still have not done that. So if you've emailed me, I promise this week I will read your emails and respond and everything like that. I do have several ghost story, um, listener stories in my catalog that I'm going to pull out and do for the next episode. And then after that, I'm back to my listener suggestion list. I am also looking for suggestions for Halloween episodes. Last year, I did four locations. This year, I think I'm only going to do three. And I'm going to start doing them now, actually. So that way, I can actually enjoy my holidays in October. I always do this where I think I'm going to have all the time in the world and then all the October activities go on and I'm sitting in front of a desk recording when I wish I could be out enjoying my favorite holiday. So this year I'm doing it different. I'm going to make these episodes way in advance and they'll be coming out during the month of October and I'm only going to do three episodes instead of four just for my own sanity so it's a little less um, hard. Last year I almost didn't get the fourth one out in time so I was just so stressed out. So this time I'm only going to do three episodes. And um, just so everyone knows, Valinska Axe Murder House is off the table um, because I'm going to hopefully do a collaboration with a ghost hunting group that is going there in November. So I hope that all works out. Um, If not, I'm still going to do Valinska Axe Murder House another time. But that one's off the table for Halloween. And also Lizzie Borden House is on the table for Halloween. So I only need two Um, locations for Halloween. And if they don't make my top Halloween list, that's fine. I will add them to my listener suggestion episode and I will do them later when I'll give you guys a shout out, you know, that kind of thing. As always, if you have any questions about my sources, they are all down below in the show notes. And if you can't see the extended list of show notes, please go to my website. I have a link down below to that. It's just a Podbean account right now. But I do have an official website and that is where you can see more of my sources links on that website. Social media handles are all linked down below as well. If you would love to get in contact with me, you can email me at historicallyhaunted.313 at gmail.com. So many holidays passed by when I wasn't making these episodes. So happy everything I missed. Happy Pride Month. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Father's Day. Happy 4th of July because 4th of July is only uh, about a week away now. So again, thank you all so much for listening to this episode. I hope you guys are all doing well. I'm so happy to be back and I can't wait for more episodes of Historically Haunted. Bye everybody. I have never been shy about talking about my struggles with dyslexia, but I also think it is really important for people to know the signs so that they can get help. Dyslexia is a learning disability that is not well known, but it is way more common than you might think. In fact, 1 in 10 people are diagnosed with dyslexia. Some of the common signs is late talking, learning new words slowly, writing letters backwards, and a delay in reading and spelling. There is no cure for this, and although it's challenging, it does not mean that we are stupid because dyslexia does not affect intelligence. It is better for children to get diagnosed early so that they can get accommodations they need in school. If you are an adult and think that you might have it, it is never too late to ask for help. One website I find helpful is dyslexiaaid.org, 
where you can find out some great information. Understanding and educating others about dyslexia is just as important as diagnosing someone with it.